Hi, I'm Michael Hoffman, and I'm gonna talk to you about gene regulation and motif analysis. Um, so by the end of the lecture today, you're going to understand challenges in predicting transcription factor binding, be able to identify binding sites for known transcription factors, and be able to discover binding motifs using various software. Um, so we'll talk a lot, we'll focus on your eukaryotic transcription, and then I'll cover a number of individual topics related to it. So here's a oversimplified model of what transcription is. Um, so you have a, a stretch of DNA, um, and there is a region in the DNA that is a transcription factor binding site. The transcription factor binds to the DNA at the binding site. It recruits RNA polymerase II. RNA polymerase II produces RNA. Downstream of that, you get function of some sort. So it will change a cellular activity, change, change the way the cell acts, all sorts of possible things. In reality, of course, this is much more complicated. You know, in humans, there are more than 1,600 transcription factors. Sometimes they act in concert. They cooperate. They compete. But you know, this is understanding how this works for even one transcription factor is, is still quite a, a research and, and computational challenge. Um, there's a lot more that happens than just having, say, a single transcription factor binding site. Um, if you have a particular gene, say, let's have a transcription start site of the gene right here. Uh, sorry, this isn't working. There we go. Um, so let's say you have the transcription factor, sorry, transcription start site right here. You know, there are a variety of transcription factor binding sites that might be nearby. Um, and things can also be affected by distal transcription factor, transcription factor binding sites. Um, the way things work as far as distal transcription factor binding sites being connected to um, transcription start sites that are far away is often by action of the 3D organization of the genome, right? So often things that are considered distal and are far away along the, along the length of a chromosome can actually be pretty close in um, three dimensions. I keep hearing a little echo whenever anyone comes into the room. Um, so people have started looking you know, at various other factors that can affect whether transcription factor is going to bind at a particular position. So here's a diagram of, of a chromosome zooming in through several orders of magnitude um, until you get down to the level of individual nucleosomes, individual DNA base pairs, and, and so on. Um, and people have developed a lot of different assays where they can experimentally assess different aspects of the chemical and physical properties of the genome at particular places. So for example, you have techniques like DNA-seq, TAC-seq, FAIR-seq that can tell you where regions of open chromatin are. You know, these are often the regions where transcription factors can actually bind, which can be very important. You know, techniques like CHIP-seq, which will, which will tell you both which parts of particular histones are modified in particular ways, like you know methylation, um, various other things, that modifications that can happen. Um, there's also chip seq for finding the transcription factors themselves, and then RNA seq will tell you where all of the genes that are being transcribed are. But you can also use RNA seq in a variety of different ways that will tell you about what's happening in different cellular subcompartments and look at things other than just messenger, messenger RNAs. So the ENCODE project was something that, that started, oh, 13 years ago or so. Um, and the NIH decided to look in a number of human and mouse cell types 
um, and there were also some extensions to worm and fly, um, and see how much we could figure out about the context of the genome in particular particular regions. So, you know, in particular cell types, can we see the difference in which transcription factors are bound, which regions of chromatin are open, um, and from that we can create a model of gene regulation that includes not just where the genes are, but it also includes things like where cis regulatory elements are um, and things like where long range regulatory elements, things like enhancers and, and so on. Um, so ENCODE published their results in, in a, across a couple of different phases. So I'm showing you here, uh, journal covers from both the first and second phases of ENCODE. There have now been two other phases of ENCODE that have produced ever more information on what is going on, mostly with transcriptional regulation in the cell, um, also some translational uh, regulation. And all of this stuff you can, um, you can find, you can find all of the data that they've produced free on the web at ENCODEproject.org, um, or you can use things like the UCSC Genome Browser or Ensemble, all have access to these, these various sorts of, of data. Um, so it kind of gives you an overview of transcription, transcriptional regulation overall. And now I'm going to delve quite deeply into to one part, the, the simplest part, going back to my oversimplified version of things at the end, beginning, which is how do you model uh, the the binding of individual transcription factor binding sites by a transcription factor. Before I go on, does anyone have any questions? Okay. And by the way, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to either speak up or I'm trying to keep the um, Zoom chat available for, you know, to identify your questions over here on the right. I can't also do the Slack chat, unfortunately, at the same time. So if you have any questions you want me to answer in the middle, uh, please feel free to type them into the, we are, the Zoom chat. Uh, hi, yes. Michael uh, Francis here. So we've actually disabled or, or not using the, the Zoom chat. Uh, but we are following the, the Slack chat and we'll interrupt you. The instructors will interrupt you if they think it's a, they'll either answer the question directly or, or they'll okay. interrupt you and ask you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so, and then you, at the end of the class, you can check the, the Slack if we got anything wrong or if we forgot to answer something. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm well, no, signed it's into okay. no, bioinformatics.ca on my, on my on Slack, spare yeah. computer here. So, on your spare computer. Okay. Anyways, we, we, we're there to, to cover for you. Okay. There, so awesome. Yeah. So go ahead. Sorry. Um, so teaching computer science transcription factor binding sites. So let's talk about what transcription factors recognize. So you might find here an example of a single site for a transcription factor and their variety of, of you know, both in vivo methods like ChIP-seq and the variety of in vitro methods you can use to figure out what sort of site a transcription factor likes. Um, the thing about transcription factors is that most of them bind to degenerate patterns, right? So there won't be just one sequence of DNA that a transcription factor binds to. There's going to be a whole set of binding sites that you might identify through through an experiment. You can see here an example of some of these, right? And so you can see um, that there are there are places in these patterns of this 30 or so binding sites for the, that have been identified for this transcription factor where things are the same. Like for example, column four here is always a T, right? Column five is almost always a T. There's one case where it's not a T, right? Then there are other columns where, you know, co column one is, you know, all over the place, A, C, G, C, G, C. It's, I don't think it's ever T though, right? So, so, so they're quite complicated patterns that you can see in, in what a transcription factor will recognize. And there are a variety of ways of representing that too. So one way you can represent it is by using a consensus sequence, right? So the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry um, came, came up with a, a ex extended alphabet that allows you to represent um, any combination of DNA bases, right? So, you know, you might've seen 
you know, R means either A or G, you know, Y means either C or T. And there's a whole series of these for, for all sorts of other combinations of bases and even little mnemonics that you can, you can use to remember them, right? So V is what, what comes after, you know, comes after T slash U. That means not T slash U. So it actually means A or C or, or G and so on. There's, you know, and there's, there's other mnemonics you can use to learn different parts of these. This does not really uh, summarize what we have over here on the right very well, right? Because for example, you have things like this first column we have is V means either A, C or G, right? Whereas this fifth column, we have represented as W. Oh. Technology, right? Okay, let's try this again. This fifth column as as W, right? W means um, it means weak, A or T, right? Um, but this column, as I mentioned earlier, it's only A once, right? It's almost always T, and you're treating it kind of the same as as this one, which is you know. A, C, or G all over the place. Um, so people have come up with more complex, complex models to represent how a transcription factor works. Right? And most of these are based on something called a position frequency matrix. And what you do to create a position frequency matrix from a set of binding sites is fairly simple. For each column, in your line binding sites, you simply count up the number of times you see each base, right? So we see C, one, two, you know, three. Okay, it looks like this PFM doesn't actually correspond exactly to this set of binding sites because we actually see C four times here. Um, so this should be four, right? I think the G here we see three times. Now we see it four times also, right? The G we see four times, and so on and so forth. And you know, you can go to column four here, which you can see is always T each of these 21 times, column five, which is T all but one time, and so on and so forth. So this is this is a pretty good way of taking any set of of aligned binding sites and turning them to a very simple model. The model is a little too simple though. Um, I'll tell you about why that is in a second. Um, but one other thing you might want to consider is that you know this is this is not very easy for a human to look at and interpret. So people often represent what a position frequency matrix or similar matrices look like um, using these sort of sequence logos. Right. Many of you have probably seen these before. Probably fewer of you know that under under the hood, you know, this is just a representation of some sort of matrix matrix model. And you can see things like the fact that column four is always T, right? Column five is T most of the time. It's A a little bit of the time. And you know, this sort of representation makes it much easier for, for us as, as human scientists to see which are, which are the you know, important parts of the motif of the transcription factor, right? And which parts are not very important because you can see that there are, they are smaller, which means that there's more variation in those positions, All right? So in reality, Actually, the, the sequence logos you'll see in a paper usually are not directly from a position frequency matrix. We convert them into something called a position weight matrix first, because that's something that is more um, generalizable to, to many other contexts. So I'll show you how you do that here. I made a much smaller PFM as, as an example, right? So this is one that was derived from only five counts um, and it has only only five, five columns as well. So you start with the, the position frequency matrix for any given base, any given position within the, the motif, um, and you apply a number of corrections to it, right? So the first thing you do is you correct for the nucleotide frequencies in the genome. So various genomes are either IT rich or GC rich. Um, if you are looking in an AT-rich genome, it will be less surprising for you to see a string of A's and T's, right? Essentially, this is something, this, this dividing by the frequency of that base is a way of correcting for that. 
Um, the second thing that we do is we wait for the sample size of the position frequency matrix. Essentially, we want to take the fact that if we say had 30 observations and got particular frequencies from them, that would give us more information than say only the five we have here, right? That's kind of the intuition we want to, we want to add in. Um, the other aspect is that we are, we are creating a probabilistic model with these. And the thing about probabilistic models is when you have any zeros in them, you know, as you know, zero multiplied by anything is going to be equal to zero. So you, know, you could eliminate ever seeing CG or T from any motif match of this motif if you left these at zeros. And we don't actually want that. Um, we want to indicate that, say, an A is much more likely and the other three are less likely, um, but we can do that just by taking these zeros and adding, adding a pseudo count. Um, so how do you know which pseudo count to, to add? Um, I will say usually people add one. All right, so that's the, the minimum that you can add that, that you know, is a nice integer. It makes everything, uh, makes nothing zero within the, within the matrix. So if you added that here, you would get six, one, 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 three, four, one, two, three, two, two, and so on. You just add one to every, to every cell in the matrix. Um, and it, you know, that one is weighted against the number of initial observations you had. So again, if you had 100 observations to start with, that pseudo count of one you're adding on isn't going to change things very much. If you have five, you should be way less confident in the model you're generating just for those five, and it will. Um, and the third thing that, that we're going to do is we're going to take the log of, of the results of steps one and two. Right, and so that converts the position frequency matrix into something called a PWM position weight matrix. It can also be called a position specific scoring matrix. Taking the log just makes it, you know, mainly it makes it easier for computers to to deal with it. Right, you might think that computers are very fast at multiplying, but they're actually way better at adding. And if you are scanning a genome of three billion base pairs for some motif, it is to a big advantage if you can just make sure that you are, you know, adding. You do all the you 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 do a logarithmic transform in advance, and then you just have to do a bunch of adding. You also don't have to worry about um, various sorts of underflow errors case anyone here is concerned about that. Um, so here's an example of how you'd use a position weight matrix to score a particular region of the genome against, uh, against the motif you know for a transcription factor. All right, so if we want to score TC, TGC, TG, right, um, all we do is we look at the appropriate column in the position weight matrix, T, and find the right row for each column, T, G, C, T, G. You take all of those, you add them up, right? And then you get a score um, for, the, for, the mo for the sequences match to this position weight matrix. Very easy. Um, of course, you know, then we have a question of what does a score of 0.9 actually mean, right? So there are additional layers on top of this that, you know, make it easier to scale um, a particular match. And one thing that we will do is we will take the sort of raw score that I showed you in the previous slide, right? So here you can see another example of G, 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 et cetera, right? So G, 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 um, C, et cetera, All right? And you get some score out of that just by adding up what's in the particular row in the right column of the, of the position weight matrix. If you wanna know, you know how, how good that score is compared to a really good match to the, the matrix versus a really bad match to the matrix, the, the easiest way to do it is just to find out what the score is for the best match Right? So in this case, for this matrix, it will be 15.2. And the score for the worst match 
which will be minus 10.3. And then you can just use that to put the absolute score you got into context just by subtracting the, abs the minimum score from the absolute score, dividing that by the range of scores. And so then you can see that this particular sequence matches the SP1 motif um, with, you know, it, it, it's 93% as good of a score as is possible with this model. Um, and then you can make that something, you know, so that just tells you over the possible, the space over possible matches to the model. Then something you might actually be interested in doing is comparing that against all of the matches you might find in the genome or other search space you're, you're looking at. And you can use, you can look at all of the matches, you know, you can genome wide that you might find to that uh, motif, and you can compare, you know, where where you are versus um, where you are versus what is to the right on the curve, right? So how often do you find a relative score that is that is better? And you can convert that to an empirical p-value just by taking the frequency of what what is under the curve to the right. Um, all right, so where do, where do transcription factor motifs come from? Um, there are a variety of different databases you can use. Um, so the one that I think is most often used these days is called Jasper. It is um, open and free. You can download a lot of individual uh, motifs that have been curated from the literature. And there are various other um, resources you can use as well. But I like, I like using Jasper. And if you use any of the standard motif um, analysis software out, out there, especially things that use some sort of web server, Jasper will usually be, be an option. All right. Any questions on this part? All right, um, let's move on. So the next part is um, how do we get these bindings? How, how do we, you know, get these motifs in the first place, right? Like, you know, we're, I started with a set of motifs from Jasper um, that came from somewhere, um, you know, you could, you can take the analysis I showed you of the set of binding sites from the beginning and create a position frequency matrix from that. But unfortunately, things aren't going to be aligned at the beginning. Francis, are, is there a question or something? No, or, no, no, no. no. Okay. I just, no, sorry. Sorry for- No problem. I, I just saw you pop up and I'm like, oh. I know. Yeah, I just wanted to be present more, uh, I guess. So you knew somebody was watching your talk as opposed to a bunch of close <laughs> cameras. <laughs> I see. So, so- you know, I'm grateful to the nine other people who I think have, have, <laughs> have turned their camera on. Um, so, brave new you, world. You might, you, might, you might encourage people to do the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, the motif discovery problem is given a bunch of sequences that we suspect might have some sort of motif in, in, col in common, how do we find that motif, right? Um, so we want to find you know, that motif or even a number of motifs. We don't know the width of the motif. We don't know where the motifs are, right? So it's not all given to us at the beginning. Like, like I showed you at the very beginning with the, you know, everything nice and aligned in columns. You have to kind of do that alignment yourself. Um, this is hard because the inputs can be really long. It can be thousands or millions of, of base pairs. Right. And the motif instances can be very short um, and they can only they, they might only be slightly similar because the motif can be highly, highly degenerate. Right. Um, so I'll give you a you know, I'll take that slightly abstract task and give you a, a somewhat more concrete example, which is let's say you do a um, gene expression experiment. Right. You do you do an experiment where you. Um, you know, knock out some transcription factor, for example, and you do RNA-seq before and, and after, right? And then you look at a set of genes that have been changed be between the two different versions of the, the experiment, right? And you want to figure out, you know, what motif of something that might be responsible for, for 
changing which genes are expressed. Did I hear so actually, something? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, yeah, I was, I was sighing. So, <laughs> sorry, but <laughs> but but it was a prelude to a question. So um, when you say in the previous slide, you said so the input, so the input you use could be quite very quite a bit. Is in that is that in the case of experimentally it's large or is because you decide you, you don't know where to, to limit your, your search space. So you're taking, I don't know, let's say hundred KB in front of every gene or some of like that is. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is that, I mean, is that, is that basically, it's not because you've done experiments that sort of point you to a, a million bases. It's because you've decided to look up at a million bases, right? Yeah. I mean, usually millions is kind of an outer outer yes, bound of yes, this, yes, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, no, <laughs> um, but, that, but that's, it's actually an important concept to, so most transcription factors are within 100 KB or within 10 KB, right? Yeah, I mean, if you were going, it, it, I mean, if you we're, were talking going to do exactly sapiens. what I'm talking about here, like yeah. 10 KB is probably the outer limit of what you would okay. look at upstream of a of a gene. I'm not of to a human, say, gene, human gene we're talking a, about. A yeah. human gene, yes. Yes. Not to say that, you know, a relevant transcription factor might be 100K away. Like that is quite likely that there will be a relevant transcription factor yeah. affecting yeah. the distal enhancer. But at that point, you know, the, the haystack gets a little too big uh, and gets harder to pick that needle out. So sure. usually when people are doing this sort of analysis I'm describing here, um, they might be looking at 10 KB upstream of the TSS the gene max, yeah. uh, more often probably like 5,000 or, or 2,000 base pairs or, or, or something like that. Right. Um, yeah. there, are other, there are other environments in which you can um, you know, do this motif discovery problem where, you, you know, instead of, I give this example, but you can say use a lot of chip seek data and just look at all of your chip seek peaks, right? Or you can look at all of the, you can do differential open chromatin analysis as well, right? Any, any sort of experiment where you end up with a set of regions of the genome that you think have something to do with, um, with the, the, a transcription factor that is bound. You can you can search search within them. Um, but the challenge just, in those is relating it back to the gene of interest. Um, I mean, you know this 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 analysis I'm describing here. There's not necessarily you know you kind of have a model that there's a you know one transcription factor involved. But really, this is kind of free of the information of you know, which gene might actually be causing the change in transcription. You're just trying to look for little DNA but, words that might be involved in whatever but change in, you're But in the analyzing. example, I, I don't want to sort of get, take too much time no, no here. But, but the point you're making here, though, is you're starting from known transcripts, and then you're looking upstream of those at regions. And so you do know the gene, right? So you're I looking do. as you're targeting that, that DNA because it's, it's an upstream of a gene. Of interest. Yes, in this case, well, yeah, this this case it's a number of of oh, different basically. genes, but yeah, 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 um, yeah. I, I I think I was interpreting gene of interest slightly differently than you were using. Okay, um, okay, but yeah, these are all really good questions. So thank you for those. Okay. Okay. Um, another another challenge in this problem, of course, is that transcription factors. You know, they, they don't see the genome the way we do. You know, often things look the same to them forwards and, you know, backwards, sure. right? What yeah, we think yeah, of yeah. As, as being forwards and backwards is really, you know, quite arbitrary in a number of ways, right? So you yeah, need to look yeah, for yeah. both some motif and for, you know, some reverse complement of the, of the motif. But also right. actually it has a three-dimensional space too. <laughs> I'm not even getting into that. I'm not getting yeah, into that. But that this, is an this issue. Point. But that is an issue. Yeah. That is an issue. Yes. Okay. Um, so that, yes. Yeah, so that is not part of this particular problem. Okay. But it is, okay. is, as I mentioned, part of the, the problem generally. Um, so our problem here is to discover the sites or the um, 
or just the motif, um, given just the sequences that we we think are carrying some common motif in them. All right. Um, and how do we how do we do that? Uh, we use a common common approach in modeling, which is called an alternating approach. And the first step in the alternating approach is that we guess. All right. So we have some method that gives us a initial uh, position weight matrix. Right. We can construct it randomly. Um, and we use that to find instances of the motif in the input sequences. Right. And then we use those instances to predict a to identify a new weight matrix. And we repeat this process over and over again. Right. So this is a, a approach that is often used in various sort of modeling problems and various sorts of machine learning problems where you don't know the parameters to your model, um, but you have a lot of examples that you might train them from. Um, usually for motif elucidation, people use something called the expectation maximization algorithm, which is an alternating approach. I'm going to show you a slightly simpler alternating approach, which is called the Gibbs sampler. Um, but for your purposes, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty similar in conception. Um, so here is how we will exemplify the, the steps from the little algorithm I told you on the last slide, right? We have a bunch of sequences, you know, um, instead of just randomly, you know, get, instead of just randomly coming up with a matrix, instead we'll randomly pick, you know, little subsequences within each of these sequences, right? And then we will turn those into a position frequency matrix, um, and we'll turn the position frequency matrix into a position weight matrix. All right? And then we will use that. Um, we will, for example, take, take out one of the sequences. Let's take out sequence four and just sample position weight matrix based on the sites we've identified for one, two, three, and five. Um, and let's score position four using this, this matrix. So at the bottom here, you can see the results of what the scores are for that matrix on the sequence, sorry, on the matrix generated with all of the other sequences except for sequence four, right? And this is a key part. We don't just say, you know, go for whatever has the, the best score within the sequence. Um, we will use, we will, we will proceed probabilistically, right? So we will turn our scoring landscape into probabilities, and then we will uh, pick with the probability of, of whatever is available at different positions, a sequence to go with for the next round of our sampling, right? So even though this is 52%, you know, this right here has a score of 20%. So if we repeated this, you know, randomly about half the time you would choose this sequence, but about, you know, a fifth of the time we'll choose this and we'll go in here and then we'll cross out sequence five and predict something, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cross out the fifth sequence, you know, generate a new position weight matrix and repeat the same sort of thing on sequence five and do this over and over again, right? Um, so the fact that we don't just, you know, go for whatever has the maximum score here uh, keeps us from getting stuck in sort of local, uh, local maxima. Um, this doesn't actually guarantee that you will get the best um, global motif for a set of sequences, um, but it works surprisingly well. Um, so people will use this, or, or as I said, they'll use expectation uh, maximization, um, which is harder to explain, but has some nice, nice properties. Um, and they'll use that to, to generate various motifs. So once you generate one of these motifs, um, what do you do with it? Um, so one thing that you can do is if you've de novo discovered a new motif, you can use TomTom, Tom, which is part of the meme suite. It has a website and there's also software you can run yourself if you want. Um, and you can say search your query motif against all of, all of Jasper. Um, and it will give you a variety of uh, stats. So this query motif right here 
you know, say, oh, it actually looks like motif 795 in Jasper and has a, you know, decent, decent E value. Um, anyway, that's one thing that you can do. You can also, instead of doing that sort of motif elucidation de novo discovery yourself, you can scan the whole genome with a set of existing motifs like those from Jasper, but I think it's important to know where they come from. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about scanning the whole genome in the next part. Are there any questions first? Any other questions? Okay. All right. So how well does this model actually work? All right. Um, so a variety of researchers who have taken transcription factor binding site models that come from position wave matrices generated the way that um, I've described to you beforehand, um, and I've shown that, for example, most of the predicted sites are, are bound in vitro, um, and you know, Stormo and Fields found in biochemical studies that in vitro, um, the best weight matrices produce scores that are highly correlated with, with binding energy, right? So, you know, it's a probabilistic model, but it actually seems to uh, fit quite well with, with what you might get uh, in terms of a, a energy-based biochemical model. Um, does anyone see the, a, a problem <laughs> with this, a, a key phrase that might indicate some problems with this model? In vitro? Yes, in vitro. You've seen this before, though, Francis. No, 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 no. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I may have seen this before, but I had forgotten it. <laughs> I believe that. Uh, sounds like something I would do. Um, yes, that, that, is, that, is the, that is the key phrase, right? So this is an amazing model. It works super well in vitro. It's a really, really great model in vitro, right? OK, so here's, here's the bad. Um, in I'm vivo, not going to say anything anymore. And now I love this. This makes it more interactive. I think I think it's great. Um, but you said it right as I was about to say. You know, Ver you know, Veronique and Ruth can't answer because because I know they've heard this before. Um, but anyway, so look at the MyOD transcription factor. You know, in this paper, Pickett found that you know there's a prediction of transcription factor once every 500 base pairs of human DNA sequence. Right, um, and here's the ugly. Let's look at you know once you have hundreds of different transcription factor binding site motifs, and you scan just a single gene, you find that the whole gene is covered with matches to the transcription factor binding site. Right, so this this leads to what Wyeth Wasserman calls the futility conjecture, which is that the transcription factor binding site predictions are almost always wrong. Right, there's a reason I get I present this this lecture in the order in which I, I do. Right, I come to the part where this is all wrong after I've I've shown you how to, how everything works. Uh, does anyone have any suggestions on what we might do to make our models more useful? That I do remember, but I, I'm not going to say. Don't say. <laughs> <laughs> Any of the students, <laughs> the participants. See what's accessible? What's accessible? Okay. That's a great suggestion. Um, you can see that times have really moved on, right? Because that's, that's, that's a right answer, right? And like, yeah, the first time I presented this um, many years ago, people would have given the wrong answer. Let's go, let's go to the wrong answer. <laughs> let's go to the wrong answer first. So, so one thing that people have thought of is, you know, what if you just have a higher threshold on the model? Um, that doesn't actually help, right? Because um, the true ratio of which predictions actually represent real binding sites in vivo doesn't actually have much to do with, you know, the energetic factors of, of you know, the, how the binding site works with the transcription factor. Once, once you get beyond a particular point, that is, right? Um, so true binding sites are defined by properties not incorporated into the, the profile scores, right? Um, and 
you know, now that we have chip seek data that tells us in vivo where hundreds of transcription factors and other chromatin regulators are, you know, we can find that there are a lot of transcription factors where there's there's data that indicates biochemical presence, um, and yet there's not a good match to the motif at all. So it's kind of, you know, we're we're kind of messed up going and, and coming, both that we make a lot of predictions that are, you know, invalid. Um, and that a lot of the places where we know there are good, you know, there's presence of the transcription factor, we can actually find a decent motif match, right? I'll skip that. Um, so as Austin suggested, you know, there's other information, biochemical information that I told you about the context of the region um, that will that will tell you. Um, where binding sites are likely to actually occur, um, which you can use in concert with the sort of um, sequence-based method I told you about before. All right, so where can you get this sort of information? Uh, one, one place you can get it is from um, software called Segway, which is from my lab. Segway is developed as part of the ENCODE project, and it has it takes a lot of different information from things like, you know, attack or things like chip seek, and it does integration of data of multiple assays across the genome, and then will allow you to define things like, you know, where are transcription start sites and where are repressed regions of the genome, you know, and maybe you should be um, looking for transcription factor binding sites more in those regions that have signs of signs of activity, right? So maybe you should look at them here, right? Where it seg segues says regulatory, or you can look at it in this slightly broader region where it says, um, you know, transcription start site related or something like that. Um, anyway. If you go to segway.hoffmanlab.org, you can you can load it into the UCSC genome browser. Um, but there are other sorts of contexts that matter as well. Uh, people are starting to look more into shape of DNA locally at particular positions, right? So we we like to have this rigid model of DNA. In reality, uh, DNA is not so rigid, and DNA will change shape a little bit depending on what the context of nucleotides are, right? So you have what people call propeller twist. That's the thing in the middle here where, you know, one uh, one base in a pair will twist slightly different direction. You have things like helical twist that works kind of like this, right? These are all things that can affect where transcription factor binding sites work, and you can kind of scan position weight matrices against things like helix twist, twist and propeller twist and, and, and so on. Um, you know, there are also a variety of methods like things like centipede or things like hint that will use open chromatin footprints, uh, methods like virtual chip seek for my own lab that integrate a lot of different kinds of data. Um, there are a lot of big challenges ahead, such as understanding all transcription factors across the developing organism, um, understanding how genetic variation affects the transcription factor binding site, um, integration of more complex models, and you know maybe transition from from these simple matrix-based models that have worked so well, uh, but you know really don't model everything we know about the way transcription factors work together um, with models that can that can incorporate dependence on one position within the motif to, to the next, right? Um, you know, finally, if you wanna get a picture of how transcription works overall, um, you have to deal with this massive amount of complexity and that it's not just an individual transcription factor binding like I showed you in the first slide, but it is many transcription factors interacting with each other across three-dimensional space. Um, all simply to define whether an individual uh, gene is transcribed, right? And then, of course, there's still all that downstream stuff, right? How does the gene get spliced? Um, how does the RNA degrade or not? How does it get translated? You know, so many things that can affect whether the RNA sticks around or gets translated in protein and, and so on. So, Michael, um, yes. um, Isabel from uh, Win Heights Lab asks a very good question about uh, where sort of where do you, tissue specificity come into play? Where does tissue specificity come into play? 
Yes, that's a that's a good question. Um, so, yeah. So, so the interesting thing is, of course, those you know, if you're using a purely sequence based model, there is no t tissue specificity, right? So you have to use um, you have to use things like um, the data from ENCODE that you know will tell you which parts of the genome are different in which tissue types. Um, and you know, if you use the latest latest generation of of methods for um, examining transcription factor binding, like my own, you know, labs, my own labs virtual chip seek, um, you can incorporate that sort of information. Um, but yeah, you, it's not really done necessarily when defining the motif, but you know, you can add that as a layer on where you look only in regions that you think are active in a particular cell type um, for the uh, binding of a particular transcription factor. Good question. There are other questions. Um, well, I had another one, which I thought you were going to get to, I guess, with this sort of taking into account evolutionary sort of relatedness of transcription factors between closely related organisms. Yeah, so that's that's another, you know, there are a variety of, of other directions we can go in from here. Um, you know, there, there, there's additional information that we need to bring to bear on the problem, right? So sequence, sequence isn't enough. Um, so one thing that you can use is, is evolutionary conservation as Francis points out. Right, um, which has uh, pros and cons. Right, so on the one hand, when you look at regions that are non-coding regions that are conserved across different organisms, um, often you will find they are conserved for a region. Sorry, a reason, um, and that's a strong indicator that there's actually some transcription factor uh, binding site that is that is you know important under selective pressure there. Um, so it can be a good way of eliminating um, false positives, right? But also if you look only at those regions, you're gonna get a you're lot of false things. negatives. Yeah. You're gonna miss a lot of things, right? Um, so it's important to realize if you're considering evolutionary conservation um, that that Conservation and selection don't really work quite the same way in non-coding regions that they do in coding regions, right? So coding regions are very, you know, very nice. You can make nice, nice alignments of, you know, of things. These are all A's, but these, let, let, let's, these are alanines, right? Not, <laughs> not adenine, right? So like, you know, let's say that, you know, you have some region, it's some protein, you know, you might find across many organisms. Um, things will often be very similar and where they aren't, they'll at least be in the same order, right? Like, let's say you have some region in the middle of some protein that's disordered, right? You know, this might not match across species, but the parts on the left and the right will, will match very well across species. Mm -hmm. This, this rule, this order doesn't really work when you're looking for alignment between things um, across, uh, across species in non-coding regions, right? A, a, what, what I think is a better model is one that was developed by Duncan Odom and Michael Wilson and others, which is that there can be transcription factor binding site turnover. Um, so, you know, let's say that there's an important select, selection reason for, or, there to be a transcription factor binding site for a particular transcription factor upstream of, of some gene, right? Um, you like, let's say you need you need the star and you need the square and you need the circle. Um, because of the way things work in three dimensions, these don't necessarily need to be in the same order, right? So over evolutionary time, you might find a redundant, a redundant star transcription factor 
you know, rises up in the evolutionary lineage, right? And then this one isn't necessary anymore. So now the order has changed to star circle, circle square, um, which for a traditional alignment algorithm, you know, might look very different. It's not going to see these sure. things as being related because they're on the wrong side of this, this circle and square, right? Yeah. But for the transcriptional machinery in the cell, you know, there might be no difference between these these things, and it works just but, as well. But here you're assuming that the alignment tool you're using is looking for a string, uh, the longest string, as opposed to the presence of three substrings at whatever right. order, in whatever order. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you are looking instead at which transcription factor or binding sites you find in a particular region, you know that might be a much better better approach than say sure. just looking for, you know, the longest a, a long longest line string. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. I've already said much of the <laughs> reflections here. Sorry, uh, but you need to. No, no, no. It's fine. Like I said, I like these things to be interactive. It's a little more interactive usually when we meet in, in person. So I appreciate Francis yeah. adding this on. Um, 